Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a great week, and I'm glad you could join us. This week's case is a 38-year-old female with Takayasu arteritis that presents with cold, pulseless right arm. Her presenting EKG is shown here. Before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice that we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that we have a list that we'll go through before making our final interpretation. First, at the top, we have the regularity. Okay, and the regularities, we're gonna look at what is the regularity of the rhythm, meaning are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? And if it's irregular, we have to see if it's regularly irregular or irregularly irregular. Next, we have the heart rate in which we simply wanted to determine the rate of the rhythm. Then we'll look at the rhythm origin. That is where is the rhythm actually starting from within the heart? And then we have to determine the ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us with our differential diagnosis. Then there's the atrial, atrioventricular, and intraventricular conduction, looking at if we have normal or abnormal conduction anywhere in the heart. And then we'll look at the waveforms, which would include all the waves, the segments and intervals, and lastly, anything else, meaning is there something else that we've missed or still need to mention? We'll look at the R wave progression as well as the transitional zone in the precordial leads. Now, after we've gathered all this information, we'll make a final interpretation. Now, what I want you to do is pause the video, take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video and we'll walk through it together. So our 38-year-old female with Takayasu arteritis that presents with a cold, pulseless right arm has this EKG. So let's go through it. First, you probably notice that this is a regular rhythm, okay? And why is that? Well, notice that when we look at regularity, okay, we want to look at the R to R intervals, okay? You can look at any interval, but the R waves tend to be the most apparent and the easiest ones to make out. So this is our R wave. Here's the next R wave, okay? Remember the R wave is the first positive deflection after a P wave. So this is our R to R interval from one R wave to the next. And if you continue to go through this, the next R to R interval is this, okay? And the one that follows is to this R wave. The one after it is this. And if you were to continue to go through this, you would see that all of these R to R intervals throughout this rhythm strip are all the same, meaning that the duration between them is quite similar. And because of that, we call this a regular rhythm. So the regularity of the rhythm is regular. Okay, so we're dealing with a regular rhythm. Now, what did you get for the heart rate? Well, this is a regular rhythm, so there's a couple ways we can figure out the rate. Okay, one would be to simply count the number of ventricular complexes going across the EKG, multiply that number by six, because we know that the standard 12 lead EKG represents 10 seconds, okay? And what do we mean by that? So let's just erase this. Okay, so remember the standard EKG from beginning to end here is 10 seconds, okay? So if you, we know if we multiply that by six, it's 60 seconds, okay? And 60 seconds is one minute, meaning that if we count the complexes going across, we'll have the beats per minute and at least an estimate of that. So let's do that here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay, so you would do 11 times six, and that's 66 beats per minute, okay? So that's an estimate of the rate. Now we said there's another way we could do it because we have this regular rhythm, okay? And how is that? So we'll erase this here. So what you'll do is you'll want to find one of those tall R waves that falls on one of the thick lines, okay? And we can take this QRS complex here. Notice this R wave falls pretty much on that line. And we're going to want to find the next R wave, okay, which is here. This is our next R wave. And we want to count the number of thick lines from between them, okay? So this is one, two, three, four, five. So it's between four and five, okay? In other words, if you did 300, over four for those four thick lines, you had 75 beats per minute. And then if you do 300 over five, that's 60 beats per minute, okay? So we have the rate that's somewhere between this, between four and five, okay? So we have a rate between 60 and 75 beats per minute, similar to this. The actual one that came on the machine was 66 beats per minute, and that's actually what we got here using that first way. Okay, so we have a normal rate here. We have a regular rhythm. Now we have to look at the rhythm origin. Well, notice that we have narrow QRS complexes, so it must be supraventricular in origin that is originating from above the ventricles. We can also make out clear defined similar shaped P waves in each lead. So we have to ask ourselves, are we dealing with sinus rhythm? Okay, so how do we define sinus rhythm? Because this seems to be 
uh, something that is misunderstood. Okay, so remember, when we look at sinus rhythm, that means it's originating from the sinus node. This is our right atrium, our left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle using our box diagrams. When we put the sinus node, it's up here, high in the right atrium, near, near that superior vena cava. We have then from the sinus node, which is this here, we have these internodal pathways. We have a Bachman bundle that comes in interface the left atrium. We have the AV node, and then from the AV node, you have this His bundle, the right bundle branch, and the left bundle branch that then uh, subdivides into a anterior and posterior fascicle. Okay. Now the focus here is on the sinus node. Okay, to determine if we're dealing with sinus rhythm meaning that we're looking mainly right here. So if you were to take that right atrium and superimpose it on this, that would mean our sinus node sits at that area, okay? Remember, we have these internodal pathways that are coming down, so the conduction pathway is heading in this direction, okay? And that's why we're looking for a P wave axis between zero degrees and positive 75 degrees. That's the normal P wave axis because that's the way uh, most of the atrial depolarization heads in, okay? So if it's heading in that direction, we have a wave heading in this direction, that means those leads that are in that area will have upright P waves, okay? Remember the P wave represents atrial depolarization. This is lead one, the positive end. Remember this is positive 90 where AVF sits, okay, that's positive end. We have lead two that sits here at 60 degrees. And then in our horizontal plane, we have V4, V5, and V6, those left lateral leads. And then we have AVR that sits here, okay? Now, all these leads that are here where that impulse is heading to will all be positive. Now, notice the impulse will be moving away from AVR, so AVR here will be negative in sinus rhythm, okay? So remember, sinus rhythm means that we have the rhythm originating from the sinus or sinoatrial node, SA node, okay? So what we want to see here is we said lead one. We want to see upright P waves. This is lead one. Here's our upright P waves. Here's lead two, the same thing. If we look at our uh, left lateral uh, precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6, okay, you can slightly make out some P waves there, okay? They're there, or maybe a little harder to see, but if you look at AVR, which is here, we said we would see negative P waves, okay? And you certainly do see these negative P waves preceding the QRS complex, okay? And that's another thing you want to make sure of. You want the QRS to have a, a corresponding P wave, and there should be one P wave for every QRS complex, that constant ratio, and you want to have a P wave that precedes each QRS complex, okay? So again, if you look here, here's lead two, this is a P wave, and then we have our QRS complex. P wave, QRS complex, P wave, QRS complex. This one that after is the T wave, okay? So again, P wave, QRS complex, there's always one P wave for every QRS complex, okay? And that's part of what we need to make sure we have in sinus rhythm. So because we're meeting all this criteria here, we do in fact have a rhythm that's originating from the sinus node. So sinus rhythm is present. Next, we need to look at the ventricular or QRS axis, okay? And you should have gotten a normal ventricular axis, okay? The actual axis here was positive 15 degrees. So I'll erase this here so we can kind of start over and use this, all right? So positive 15 degrees, and remember, that's within normal limits. So we have a normal ventricular axis, and we'll write this here, so normal and we'll see why it was positive 15 degrees. Now, remember, when we talk about electrical axis, that means where the mean electrical impulse is heading. And when we talk about the QRS axis, we're talking about the ventricular, so where the impulse in the ventricles is heading, that mean axis, okay, of all the small uh, individual cardiomyocytes, each one will have their individual vectors, and the summation of them is what we call our mean electrical axis, okay? So remember, this is zero degrees where the end, the positive end of lead one sits. This is positive 90 degrees. This is the AVF, okay? This is plus or minus 180 degrees, and this is negative 90 degrees. Normal axis, remember, is between negative 30 degrees here and about positive 105 or positive 110 degrees, okay? Meaning that from negative 30 all the way to here is considered normal axis, okay? And then we have right axis deviation, which is typically in this quadrant here. So this is right axis, this is left axis deviation, and this is what we call the 
northwest axis or extreme extreme axis deviation okay over here we don't tend to see things maybe you'll see ventricular tachycardia heading in that direction and that could be a sign for it um, we won't see that here all right so let's see what is our axis uh, here so we want to look at lead one and notice that lead one has these upright QRS complexes remember we're looking at the ventricular axis so we're looking at the QRS complexes so lead one is positive meaning we're going towards this positive end of lead one AVF is right here Notice that we have these upright QRS complexes that are positive, meaning we're going to the positive end of AVF. That means our axis lies somewhere in this region, okay? And already, we know that that's within the normal limits, okay? So that's normal axis, and that's what we have here, okay? The actual axis is positive 15 degrees. So if you were to see that, that would be about right here. And that's positive 15 degrees which the EKG machine got, and we won't go there. As long as we have the normal axis, we're good for now. So let's move on to atrial conduction. Well, typically we look at leads two and V1, okay? Or you can look at the other inferior leads, but these tend to have um, where we can see the P wave or atrial abnormalities, um, the, they tend to be the most evident in those leads. In leads two and V1, we actually don't reach the P wave amplitude for right or left atrial enlargement. And the total duration of the P waves in leads two and V1 appear within normal limits, which is less than 120 milliseconds or three of those small boxes. So in atrial conduction, we can say that it's normal here. How about atrial ventricular or AV conduction? Well, in this case, we're looking for any conduction delays as the impulse travels between the atrium ventricles because the majority of the PR interval represents the AV nodal conduction. That's where we look. Now, the normal PR interval in adults, and we have a 38-year-old female here, so this is an adult, is between 120 and 200 milliseconds or three to five small boxes. And in this case, it appears to be normal. Okay, so we have a normal uh, PR interval. It, the EKG machine actually estimated it to be 190 degrees, which again confirms that. So we have normal uh, PR interval, and the PR interval here was 190. Okay, remember that upper limit is 200 milliseconds, okay, or five of the small boxes. All right, so let's look at intraventricular or IV conduction. Okay, so now this is the conduction within the ventricles. Here we're looking at the duration of the QRS complexes. The normal QRS duration is often between 70 and 110 milliseconds. That's about two to three of those small boxes. So some may also consider the upper limit to be 120. Okay, so once it hits that 120, it tends to be prolonged. Anyways, the main thing here was we're looking for intraventricular conduction to see if that QRS interval is prolonged or not. On the EKG, we can see narrow QRS complexes that appear within normal limits. And the QRS duration here was 98 milliseconds, which helps to confirm that IV conduction is normal here. Okay, so again, normal intraventricular conduction and that QRS interval here was 98 milliseconds okay which is normal okay so how about the waveforms well we already discussed the P waves there are no uh, Q waves or QS complexes that may suggest they may be a prior infarct uh, there are normal T waves. They're asymmetric. They have a slow upstroke and a steeper downslope, as we would expect. The PR segment does not appear to be significantly eleva elevated or depressed. We mentioned the PR interval is within normal limits. The ST segment is not significantly depressed or elevated throughout the EKG. The QRS interval here, we said, was within normal limits. The QRS amplitude, okay, the height or the voltage, does not seem abnormally increased or decreased throughout the EKG. And lastly, with the waveforms, uh, the QTC interval here is within normal limits and calculated to be 452 milliseconds. Remember, normal QTC interval in males is less than 440 milliseconds, but in this case, we're dealing with a female, so the upper limit is 460, okay? So 452 milliseconds is below that. So we have a normal QTC interval, and overall, there are no new major waveforms abnormalities that we have to uh, write here, okay? So uh, nothing else in this case. All right, so is there anything else here that we're missing? Well, how about the R wave progression in the precordial leads? Normally, the R wave amplitude should increase uh, in amplitude. It should progressively increase from leads V1 to V5. In this case, it does seem like the R wave progression in the precordial leads is quite normal. Okay, so let's look at the precordial leads, and that would be these leads here, V1 through V6, okay? V1 to V6, and we want to see the R wave 
increase in amplitude up until V5. So notice you have this small R wave here. Okay, these are these small R waves. And notice that the amplitude then starts to increase with each lead, okay, eventually becoming more positive, okay, throughout. So because of that, we call this a normal R wave progression. Okay, the R wave is increasing uh, as it should as we go across the, the precordium um, of the heart, okay. Now we have the transitional zone, okay, in the precordial leads, and here it appears to be between leads V3 and V4. The transitional zone is simply the precordial lead where area where the QRS is transitioning from being mostly negative to mostly positive, and the actual transition area is where the QRS is isoelectric, okay? We don't always see an isoelectric QRS complex, so it tends to be between two leads. Normally, the transition occurs between leads V3 and V4. If it comes earlier than V3, we call this a counterclockwise rotation or early transition. If it comes after lead V4, then we call this a clockwise rotation or late transition. Therefore, because the transition here occurs between V3 and V4, we call this a normal transition, okay? So a normal transition, and we will look at why that's the case, okay? So again, we're looking at the precordial leads, so these leads we just looked at with the R wave progression. And what we're looking for here is notice that in V1, which is this lead here, it's mostly negative, okay? V2, again, mostly negative compared to this small R wave, and then in V3, three, which is this lead here, you can still see this. If you were to measure them out, you'd see this is still mostly negative, okay, slightly. And then once you get to V4, you can clearly see that it becomes more positive. So the transition occurs between V3 and V4, okay, mostly around that V3. But because of this, uh, we can say it's happened somewhere between V3 and V4, and we said that's normal. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind with R wave progression and the transitional zone in the precordial leads is that it's highly dependent on lead placement, and this is still in imperfect science. Anyways, what's our final interpretation? Well, we have a regular rhythm, okay, with sinus origin, all right? The ventricular rate is 66 beats per minute. The QRS axis is normal, okay? We said at positive 15 degrees. Atrial, AV, and IV conduction, we said were normal. We saw no major waveform abnormalities. In both R wave progression and the transitional zone in the precordial leads, we found to be normal. Therefore, our final interpretation is normal sinus rhythm and a normal ECG overall. Now, when we compare it to a previous EKG, there were no significant changes from the one in front of us. It's always important to look back and compare it to the most recent EKG with a previous one to look for any new changes, okay? So let's write our final interpretation. We said it's normal sinus rhythm, okay? And then overall, we have a normal ECG. And when compared to a previous one, okay, there were no significant um, changes. All right. Now remember, normal sinus rhythm means that our rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Okay, when we're talking about adults and children, it could be different. And then again, we have a regular rhythm with uh, the rhythm originating from the sinus node. That's why we call it normal sinus rhythm. Okay. So in conclusion, our 38-year-old female with Takayasu arteritis that presents with a cold, pulseless right arm has an EKG showing normal sinus rhythm. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the Week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you can help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 150,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $100. $150, and I believe I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from the beginner level to a physician level. I've even included our pediatric lectures. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it and a number of medical schools and hospitals are beginning to use it. If you are a part of an institution, please contact us because we're giving a limited number of schools and hospitals free access to provide feedback and improve our course. And in that case, you can get the course for free.
So leave a comment below and get in touch with us. And of course, check out our brand new website, ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals, where you can find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.